Good for Near East policy, the end of this phase will not necessarily signal the end of the war. On Monday, Israel pulled tanks out of some Gaza city districts. Israeli officials say the military would draw down forces inside Gaza this month and shift to a months-long phase of more localized mopping up operations. The hints at a lower tempo in Gaza came as the U.S. Navy announced that the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier was returning to its home port in Virginia. The warship was deployed to the eastern Mediterranean following the outbreak of war. The troop reduction would allow some reservists to return to civilian life and shore up Israel's war-battered economy. Artillery fire between Hezbollah and Israel has unsettled the border since the start of the conflict. At the same time, Houthi fighters in Yemen have attacked Red Sea shipping, drawing a U.S. military response. An Iranian warship recently sailed into the waterway. Israel's move to a new stage in the conflict comes after its initial bombardment and a ground invasion that began on October 27th. Air and artillery strikes have continued to pound the entire enclave during the time, leaving much of it in ruins. Having overrun most of northern Gaza, Israeli tanks and troops are still pushing into the center and parts of the south. Hamas is responding with guerrilla-style ambush from tunnels and bunkers in the enclave's narrow streets. Qatar and Egypt are seeking to negotiate a new truce and hostages deal. Washington has said that Israel should allow a Palestinian government to control Gaza when the conflict is over. The UN says that the year 2023 was the deadliest on record for Palestinians in West Bank, with 307 killed since the war in Gaza began on October 7th. Now, for more on this, we are being joined by our correspondent, Jody Cohen from Ranana. Jody, welcome to Beyond. Now, there have been allegations that Israel carried out this strike. What more can you tell us about what Israel is saying? Hi Priyanka, so there hasn't been an official comment from the Israeli government on this. According to a US media report which quoted unnamed Israeli and US sources, that said that Israel carried out this drone strike in Beirut, killing six Hamas figures, including two senior Hamas officers and of course the Hamas deputy head Salah al arouri Now he was the leader of Hamas in the West Bank, a founding member of Hamas, and according to intelligence, he was responsible for all orchestrating many terror attacks against Israelis, such as the 2014 murder of three Israeli teens, and has been wanted by Israel for years. Now, so while there's no official comment, we do know that Israel's war goals are to dismantle Hamas, secure the release of the roughly 130 hostages still being held captive in Gaza and to ensure that there's no threat on Israel's borders. And in November, Prime Minister Netanyahu said in a press conference that he had instructed the Mossad to target Hamas's leaders wherever they are. And Mark Regev, who's the senior Israeli government spokesperson, he said last night that whoever did this, this was a precision attack on Hamas. He said it wasn't an attack on Lebanon or an attack on Hezbollah and his comments are being interpreted as um, potentially trying to convince Hezbollah to limit its response. Right, Jody, what response is expected from Hezbollah in Lebanon? I think that's the very important question. Absolutely. So Daniel Hagari, who's the Israel Defense Forces spokesperson, he didn't specifically mention this strike, but said that the Israeli military is at a very high level of readiness. And according to media reports on Tuesday, Israel was expecting a response. Hezbollah has claimed 10 attacks on Israel in the past day. And remember, we've seen daily strikes from Hezbollah into Israel since the 8th of October, which is the day after uh, Hamas's 7th of October massacre in Israel and in the past week especially we've seen a significant uptick in rockets from Hezbollah into Israel but Nasrallah who's the head of Hezbollah he was due to meet with al arouri today and give a speech on the anniversary of the death of Qasem Soleimani Iran's Quds Force commander who was killed in the US airstrike and remember Iran had said that the 7th of October attack was revenge for that killing and that's Israel's speech we heard was going to be delayed. Now we're hearing it is going to happen this evening. But in August, he had warned that he would take revenge, that Hezbollah would take revenge if Israel would go after any Syrian, Iranian, Palestinian or Lebanese leaders in Lebanon. And we, so we're expecting to see 
some sort of response. We don't know if that would come from Hezbollah or Hamas potentially in Lebanon or Hamas from Gaza. Um, but commentators are also referring to the Israeli government's strategy of putting military pressure on Hamas as a way potentially to bring them to talks and of course remains to be seen whether or not this strike even though Israel is saying it's not uh, is not commenting on whether or not it's come from Israel it remains to be seen if by targeting Hamas leaders that we will see any potential future development in those talks right let's talk about the hostage deal where does that stand in all of this that's my final question So we're not hearing of significant progress being made in this hostage deal. We've been hearing about two different talks recently, potentially number one, talks on a temporary uh, pause in the fighting in exchange for some of the hostages being released. And according to reports, Israel and Hamas's positions are far apart on that. And then we've also been hearing about Egypt's proposal, which would be for a permanent ceasefire, the release of all the hostages, and to have Gaza governed by a um, technocratic government of Palestinians. Um, we had heard that Islamic Jihad and Hamas had rejected that. Then we heard that they um, were going to Egypt for further talks. We know that an Israeli delegation has also been in Cairo for talks, but it remains to be seen as of yet uh, what will happen with either of those proposals. Right, Jody, thank you so much for all those updates and thanks for joining us at We On On This Hour. Now, Israel's war against Hamas militants has now reached Lebanon. According to Hamas and security officials in Lebanon, an Israeli strike has killed Hamas's deputy leader. As per the reports, Saleh al-Aruri was killed along with his bodyguards in an Israeli drone strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. The explosion shook Mushara Fair, one of the Lebanese capital's southern suburbs, a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. Lebanese state media reported that the strike hit a Hamas office, while other reports say a total of seven people were killed in the attack. At about 5.30, we heard the sound of an explosion, then another explosion followed by a third explosion a few seconds later. The smoke was rising heavily. The explosion shook our office. Nasale al Aruri was the deputy head of Hamas's Politburo and founder of its military wing, the Qasim Brigades. He's also a U.S. designated terrorist and has a bounty on his head. Well, Israel has previously announced the killing in Gaza of Hamas commanders and officials during the war. Aruri is the most high-profile figure to be killed, and his death came in the first strike off on the Lebanese capital since the hostilities began. The strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Israel has declined to comment on the death of Aruri, although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagari, who did not directly comment on Aruri's killing, has said, that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. Take a listen. The IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas, in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. On the other hand, Hamas's chief, Ismail Haniya, has said that Aruri's killing is a terrorist act. It is a violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and an expansion of Israel's hostility against the Palestinians. Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah has vowed to retaliate against any Israeli targeting of Palestinian officials in Lebanon. They have warned that the killing of Aruri will not go unanswered or unpunished. Palestinian Islamic Jihad has vowed revenge in a statement saying that the crime will not go unpunished and the resistance will continue until the occupation is removed. Iran has said that the killing would further galvanize the fight against Israel, while Yemen's Houthi movement have expressed their condolences. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Israel to avoid any kind of escalation. Macron, who spoke by telephone on the telephone with the Israeli minister and war cabinet member Benny Gantz, 
said that it is essential to avoid any kind of escalation, particularly in Lebanon. Toutes les condoléances de la France. Ces condoléances sont celles d'un pays ami. Solidarity and uh, our support for today, tomorrow. Well, who was Saleh Al Aruri? Let's get into some details about the man who was a U.S. designated terrorist. 57-year-old Saleh Al Aruri. He was the deputy chief of Hamas's political bureau and one of the founders of the group's armed wing, the Al Qasim Brigades. Apart from this, he had been living in exile in Lebanon for the past few years. And after spending 15 years in an Israeli jail, Aruri in recent weeks took on the role of spokesperson for the group. Well, before the war began on October 7th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had threatened to kill Aruri, Salah al-Aruri. He had threatened to kill him. The United States has also labeled him as a global terrorist in the year 2015. Apart from this, uh, uh, the, the U.S. also issued a $5 million reward for any information on Salah al-Aruri, who has been designated as a wanted terrorist. Well, the Qasim Brigades was founded in 1992, and Salah al-Aruri is one of the founders of the Qasim Brigades. And the founding leader of the military wing was Salah Shehda, who was later killed in 2002 by the Israeli forces. Although the actual leader is Mohammed Dev. He has been often described as a shadowy figure who has been living in hiding for two decades. We're talking about Mohammed Dev here. And this is because Dev's name is at the top of Israel's most wanted list. Now, the Qasim Brigade's objective is to support its armed resistance against Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. The Qasim Brigade has also carried out numerous attacks, including suicide attacks against Israel as a part of its armed struggle. Now, I will tell you how strong are the Qasim Brigades. Well, according to the CIA World Factbook, the Qasim Brigade, it has around 20,000 to 25,000 members. However, that number, this number of 20, 25,000 members, that number is disputed as of now. Well, the armed group is believed uh, to possess a large inventory of ammunition, grenades and improvised rockets, though its exact strength and military capabilities are not publicly known. Allegedly, Iran has also supported the military wing financially for the enabling group to manufacture sophisticated military capabilities. Although in the past one and a half decade of Israeli attacks, the Qasim Brigades, it has thousands of fighters and its resources have depleted in numerous Israeli air raids and military offensive in the past as well. Killing of the Hamas militant group's deputy chief Saleh al-Aruri has triggered protests across the West Bank. Thousands of Palestinians took to the streets of Ramallah, Jenin and Hebron. Hamas said the killing will not lead to its defeat. Hezbollah, meanwhile, vowed that Aruri's death will not go unpunished. Aruri's sister, Um Kutabia, also joined the protests in the West Bank. She said Aruri's contribution for Palestine will be remembered for years to come and that her brother's influence will give rise to stronger and tougher leaders. Thank God. This is an honor from God. His martyrdom is an honor. He used to wish martyrdom and we are not surprised since this is the method of the occupation. The occupation did not skip any wrongdoing. Is this a surprise? It is not. It is only natural for the occupation, but thank God. Every child in Palestine is a leader and there will be stronger leaders and tougher and they will follow in his footsteps. 
There have been calls for more protests. Palestinians have been urged to participate in marches at 1200 hours local time. Throughout West Bank, major cities, Israel has not yet confirmed any responsibility for the attack on Al-Aruri. However, it has long accused Aruri of orchestrating attacks on its citizens. Hamas officials have claimed that Aruri was at the heart of negotiations for the prisoner swap deal with Israel. Israel has vowed to destroy Hamas after the movement's unprecedented October 7th attack on Israel. Miseries mount for thousands of people who have been made refugees in Gaza as winter tightens its grip in the region. Rafah region of the Gaza Strip near the border with Egypt has become a tent city. Desperate Palestinians fleeing Israel's growing ground offensive are crowding into the shrinking safe areas of the Strip. With shelters significantly beyond capacity, people have pitched tents along the sides of the roads with just enough food to be able to survive. Thousands have relocated to the far south of the Strip and in areas declared as safe zones by the Israeli military. The numbers are so high that the UN Refugee Agency has warned that this may create additional displacement in West Asia. Everyone around the world is celebrating the New Year, watching fireworks shows. But for us, the fireworks show here is missiles. All we have are rockets and explosions, children being killed. My wish for the New Year is for the war to stop, so that we can return to our homes and live like ordinary people. And to make matters worse, the World Food Programme has said that their operations in the Strip are on the verge of collapse. Nearly 1.9 million people have been displaced since the start of the Israeli bombardment, with many yearning to go back home. The whole of Gaza has been destroyed. People could not celebrate the New Year. Our homes have been destroyed. I hope the war would end soon. I hope we can survive and live with dignity. I hope we can return to our homes, go back to school, return to everything that is familiar in the new year. Gazans are exposed to cold temperatures as they continue to live without food, water or blankets in the war-torn strip. The cold has pushed Gazans to scavenge for wood to be able to burn fires for warmth. The wood from the debris of destroyed buildings has also run out, forcing fires in Gaza to be fed by pieces of cloth and plastic. Meanwhile, tensions are spilling over from Gaza to the Red Sea as fears of a maritime war continue to mount. The Red Sea has become the new battleground, with the Yemen Houthi rebels attacking cargo vessels that are en route Israel through the southern Red Sea. In the latest, according to British Maritime Security Agency, explosions were reported near a cargo ship in the strategic Bab al Mandeb Strait. Up to three explosions were reported one to five nautical miles from the merchant vessel. The vessel was traveling between the coasts of Eritrea and Yemen. Seeing the situation unfolding in the Red Sea, the UN Security Council may meet as early as Wednesday on the situation in the Red Sea. This is according to the French ambassador to the United Nations, whose country has assumed the council presidency. Meanwhile, an aide to the leader of Yemen's Houthi movement has said that the U.S. will not escape punishment and retaliation after sinking three Houthi boats and killing 10 militants in the Red Sea. The situation has reached a point where Americans have resorted to militarizing the Red Sea and their reckless actions are affecting the international navigation serving the interests of the Israeli enemy. America is the navigator of wars, problems and chaos and it disturbs security on land and sea. They have committed a major crime by targeting our armed naval forces who were carrying out their official and routine duties in the Red Sea for the sake of navigation security. For more on this story, our correspondent Susan Tehrani spoke with the French ambassador to the United Nations whose country assumed the council presidency. Listen in. Uh, regarding the Red Sea and what's happening there, the navies of the United States, Britain and France have each shot down Houthi launched drones and missiles. The United States now believes that there should be another international coalition dealing with what's happening in the Red Sea and the Houthis separate to what's happening in Gaza. I wanted to know your views on that. Thank you. Well, uh, 
again, I speak in my uh, national capital. As a chair, I would say that uh, uh, it's very likely that the Council will meet on the issue soon, or probably uh, even tomorrow. So uh, we will confirm this, but I think the situation is bad. Uh, there is a uh, repetition of uh, violations and uh, uh, military actions in, in this area. And of course, we cannot uh, leave it like that. We need to, we need to, uh, to, to take action. Uh, in my national capacity, uh, I would just tell you that France, along with 42 partners, partners jointly condemned on December 20 the attacks committed by Houthis and the threats to the freedom of navigation. We uh, believe uh, uh, nationally that uh, we need to secure the shipping uh, in the Red Sea. It's crucial for everything, shipping of food, of fuel, humanitarian aid, and other essential goods. It's a very important uh, route, uh, of course. Uh, we cannot give up and accept the blackmail uh, which is there. So maritime safety is uh, extremely important and it needs to be protected by all means, and uh, we will continue to, to work on that with our partners. I think we, we, it's a shared concern. It's a different issue from Gaza, but uh, again, it's an additional threat posed to the stability of this region. A drone strike in Beirut's southern suburbs has killed a senior Hamas official, Saleh al-Aruri. The latest strike could mark a major escalation in the ongoing war. And there have been a slew of remarks coming in from the Western leaders on Aruri's death, urging for de-escalation. To talk more on this, we are now being joined by Dr. Avner Cohen. He's a professor of non-proliferation and terrorism studies at the Middlebury Institute. Dr. Cohen is joining us from California. Thanks very much for taking our time and joining us here on Beyond, Dr. Cohen. Good evening. Thank you. And Dr. Cohen, al Aruri is the most senior Hamas figure to be killed since the war began. How do you gauge the death affecting the ongoing war, especially after the death of Hamas leader al Aruri on the Lebanese soil? Uh, could you repeat, please, the question? I couldn't. It was a little problem. Can you restart? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I was asking yeah. you that how do you gauge Al Aruri's death? He's one of the most senior Hamas figure to be killed since the war began. How will his death affect the ongoing war? It's not clear how much it affects the war itself. It was very much needed for Israel to restore its own its own sense of credibility to its own people to its own brand image in the Middle East, and also to make, uh, to make credible its threats to take some kind of punishment or even revenge uh, to those who were directly involved in the uh, events of October 7th. It's not clear to me at this point, depends what will happen from now on, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a game change, and it's not clear what its impact on the war that's going on in Gaza. Except it's going to complicate the situation for the hostages. Uh, for now, it's suspended that thing, but it was something that Israel needed to show to others in the region, as well as to its own people, that its credibility remain and it still has the ability to take that kind of action, especially after its intelligence has failed very, very badly. Right, Dr. Go, and you... Uh, yes, please continue. No, no, no. I'm ready for your question. Yeah, I was uh, asking you that you speak of how the death of al, al Ruri will have no impact in the ongoing war. But why is that? Because he is one of the topmost Hamas leader and also the mastermind of the attack on Israel. Well, he's not the mastermind. He is very much at the top of the leadership. He is so far the highest person on Hamas leadership that was Israel was able to, to assassinate. Uh, it's actually in terms of his own knowledge about what happened on October 7th, apparently he knew about it just minutes before the action. Mm. He was involved in in the efforts. He was uh, the number two in the political office of Hamas outside Gaza. He was also involved in the uh, activities of Hamas in the West Bank. But uh, from what we know, 
Uh, he was not directly involved in the events of October 7th. Um, it's not clear it's as of now, it's direct impact on the Gaza itself, except, as I said before, it would suspend uh, the issue of the, it will complicate it, the issue of negotiation for some kind of truce uh, to uh, release or to have some kind of uh, arrangement to release uh, the hostages, or at least some of them. Right, Dr. Uh, Cohen, can we, what, what can we expect from the Hamas militants group? Will Aruri's death hinder its plans in the ongoing war or not? Well, in terms of Hamas itself, it doesn't have, I mean, you, as you know, Hamas is very much on defensive in Gaza itself. Uh, its its, its, its uh, military capabilities have been diminished. Mm. The big question is to what extent Hezbollah which is the big player in Lebanon itself, and essentially the host of, uh, of Salah Khouri in, in Beirut, in uh, the area that he, was, that he was staying, the headquarter of Hezbollah, to what extent that organization would tolerate uh, that kind of operation under its territory. And I think that could complicate things. Uh, I think that both Israel and Hamas and uh, the Hezbollah do not have interest to go right now to a full war. Mm. Nevertheless, Hamas is, I think, determined to to respond in some kind of action. Mm. But that action, I think, should be less than escalation that would go to a full war. A full war would be destruction for Lebanon. Uh, I don't think that Hamas is interested. I don't think that Israel is interested. So both sides have a narrow, narrow area to escalate, mm. but not to escalate enough in order to lead to a new war within within Lebanon and Israel itself. Right, so Dr. it's it's kind of a challenge for both sides. Right, Dr. Cohen, there are growing concerns regarding the escalation of the ongoing war. Well, Israel did not even warn the U.S. before the attack and... All this while the West is urging restraint in the ongoing war. Do you think the West will be successful in uh, trying to defuse tensions? Well, I don't think that the West has much ability to influence at this point. It's very much at this point, and we are talking just about less than just about 12 hours after the assassination or so. Uh, it's very much the question is to what extent uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, how far he would be ready to go, to what extent his response would be able to play in that narrow space of escalating, but not escalating too strong that would lead to, to, to war. Um, everybody calls for, for some kind of calm. Uh, obviously, Israel has reached its objective in a sense that it has marked, it's, it's got uh, boost to its own people. It was able to reestablish its ability to take that kind of action and to, to, to keep its brand name. Uh, now it's the turn of Hezbollah, and it's very much there is, a, so to speak, uh, an action, anxious silence right now to see what would be the Hezbollah uh, reaction. Last question to you, Dr. Cohen. Can you shed some light on Israel's trajectory at the moment? First, it reduced some troops from Gaza, and now uh, the airstrike in Beirut. What is it planned to do going ahead? Well, obviously, it's not the uh, interest of Israel to have uh, war on two frontiers at the same time. Israel could do that, but it would be very much extending of its resources and it would be tough. So Israel would like to finish what it needs to do on the Gaza front to move from the, what was called the phase two to phase three, which means some kind of, uh, of redeployment, taking some troops out of that and moving to a new change, at least the northern Gaza, mm. Gaza uh, scenario. Uh, while still raging uh, war in the southern Gaza, especially the Khan Yunis area. Uh, so Israel has no interest to go right now to a second frontier. I don't think it's Hezbollah interest as well. Mm. But at the same time, Hezbollah needs to protect and to give credibility to its own uh, brand name mm. to do some kind of reactions. And as I said, both sides have a very limited area to, to, to do that kind of escalation, but not escalation that would be too big, that would lead to, to, a, full, to a full another war. 
Brad Dr. Cohen, thanks very much for taking our time and joining us here on Vyond and sharing insights with us on this story. My pleasure. Thank you. Our top focus at this hour, tensions are spilling over from Gaza to the Red Sea. As fears of a maritime war continue to mount, the Red Sea has become the new battleground with the Yemen Houthi rebels also attacking cargo vessels that are en route to Israel through the southern Red Sea. In the latest, according to British Maritime Security Agency, explosions were reported near a cargo ship in the strategic Bab al-Mandeb Strait. Up to three explosions were reported one to five nautical miles from the merchant vessel. The vessel was traveling between the coasts of Eritrea and Yemen. According to U.S. Central Command, the two anti-ship ballistic missiles were fired by the Iranian-backed Houthi militants into the southern Red Sea. CENTCOM further added that multiple commercial ships in the area reported the impact of missiles in surrounding waters. Seeing the situation unfolding in the Red Sea, the UN Security Council may meet as early as Wednesday to assess the situation. This is according to the French ambassador to the United Nations, whose country has now assumed the council presidency. Meanwhile, an aide to the leader of Yemen's Houthi movement has said that the U.S. will not escape punishment and retaliation after sinking three Houthi boats and killing ten militants in the Red Sea. The situation has reached a point where Americans have resorted to militarizing the Red Sea and their reckless actions are affecting the international navigation serving the interests of the Israeli enemy. America is the navigator of wars problems and chaos, and it disturbs security on land and sea. They have committed a major crime by targeting our armed naval forces who were carrying out their official and routine duties in the Red Sea for the sake of navigation security. For more on this, our correspondent Susan Tehrani spoke with the French ambassador to the United Nations whose security, forgive me, whose country assumed the council presidency. Listen in to this exclusive. Uh, regarding the Red Sea and what's happening there, the navies of the United States, Britain and France have each shot down Houthi launched drones and missiles. The United States now believes that there should be another international coalition dealing with what's happening in the Red Sea and the Houthis separate to what's happening in Gaza. I wanted to know your views on that. Thank you. Well, uh Again, I speak in my uh, national capacity. As a chair, I would say that uh, uh, it's very likely that the Council will meet on the issue soon, or probably uh, even tomorrow. So uh, we will confirm this, but I think the situation is bad. Uh, there is a, a repetition of uh, violations and uh, uh, military actions in, in this area. And of course, we cannot uh, leave it like that. We need to we need to, uh, to, to take action. Uh, in my national capacity, uh, I would just tell you that France, along with 42 partners, partners jointly condemned on the 720 the attacks committed by Houthis and the threats to the freedom of navigation. We uh, believe uh, uh, nationally that uh, we need to secure the shipping uh, in the Red Sea, it's crucial for everything, shipping of food, of fuel, of humanitarian aid and other essential goods. It's a very important uh, route, uh, of course. Uh, we cannot give up and uh, accept the blackmail uh, uh, which is there. So maritime safety is uh, extremely important and it needs to be protected by all means. And uh, we will continue to, to work on that with our partners. I think we, we, it's a shared concern. It's a different issue from Gaza, but uh, again, it's an additional threat posed to the stability of this region. Israel's war against Hamas militants has now reached Lebanon. According to Hamas and security officials in Lebanon, an Israeli strike has killed Hamas's deputy leader. As for the reports, Saleh al-Aruri was killed along with his bodyguards in an Israeli drone strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. The explosion shook Mushara Fair, one of the Lebanese capital's southern suburbs, a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. Lebanese state media reported that the strike hit a Hamas office, while other reports say that a total of seven people were killed in the attack.
At about 5.30, we heard the sound of an explosion, then another explosion, followed by a third explosion a few seconds later. The smoke was rising heavily. The explosion shook our office. Saleh al Aruri was the deputy head of Hamas's Politburo and a founder of its military wing, the Qasim Brigades. He's also a U.S. designated terrorist and has a bounty on his head. While Israel has previously announced the killing in Gaza of Hamas commanders and officials during the war. And Aruri is the most high-profile figure to be killed. And his death came in the first strike of the Lebanese capital since hostilities began. The strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Israel has declined to comment on the death of Aruri, although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagari, who did not directly comment on Aruri's killing, has said that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. Take a listen. The IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas, in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. On the other hand, Hamas chief Ismail Hania has said that Aruri's killing is a terrorist act. It is a violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and an expansion of Israel's hostility against Palestinians. Hezbollah leader Saeed Hassan Nasrallah has vowed to retaliate against any Israeli targeting of Palestinian officials in Lebanon. They have warned that the killing of Aruri will not go unanswered or unpunished. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad has vowed revenge in a statement saying that the crime will not go unpunished and the resistance will continue until the occupation is removed. Iran has said that the killing would further galvanize the fight against Israel, while Yemen's Houthi movement have expressed the condolences. I want to thank you for... Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Israel to avoid escalation. Macron, who spoke on telephone with the Israeli minister and war cabinet member Benny Gantz, said that it is essential to avoid any kind of escalation, particularly in Lebanon. In other global news, Israel's war against Hamas militants has now reached Lebanon. Well, according to Hamas and security officials in Lebanon, an Israeli strike has killed Hamas's deputy leader. And as per reports, uh, Saleh al aruri was killed along with his bodyguards in an Israeli drone strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. The explosion shook Mujara Fair, one of the Lebanese capital's southern suburbs, a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. A Lebanese state media reported the strike hit a Hamas office, while other reports say that a total of seven people were killed in the attack. At about 5.30, we heard the sound of an explosion, then another explosion, followed by a third explosion a few seconds later. The smoke was rising heavily. The explosion shook our office. Saleh al Aruri was the deputy head of Hamas's Politburo and founder of its military wing, the Qasim Brigades. Well, Israel has previously announced the killing in Gaza of Hamas commanders and officials during the war. But Aruri is the most high profile figure to be killed, and his death came in the first strike on the Lebanese capital since the hostilities began. The strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Now, Israel has declined to comment on the death of Aruri, and although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagri, who did not directly comment on Aruri's killing, he said that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. On Hamas chief. The IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas, in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. On the other hand, Hamas chief Ismail Hania has said that Aruri's killing is a terrorist act. It is a violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and an expansion of Israel's hostility against Palestinians. 
And meanwhile, Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah has vowed to retaliate against any Israeli targeting of Palestinian officials in Lebanon. And they have warned that the killing of Aruri will not go unanswered or unpunished. Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they have vowed revenge in a statement saying that the crime will not go unpunished and the resistance will continue until the occupation is removed. Iran has said that the killing would further galvanize the fight against Israel, while Yemen's Houthi movement have expressed their condolences. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Israel to avoid escalation. And Macron, who spoke by telephone with the Israeli minister and war cabinet member Benny Gantz, Macron said that it is essential to avoid any escalatory attitude, particularly in Lebanon. Toutes, le, toutes les condoléances de la France. And for more on this, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, who is a military uh, uh, expert and the host of Daniel Davis Deep uh, Dive on YouTube, is joining us live from Virginia. Thanks very much for joining us on Beyond, Colonel Davis. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, Colonel Davis Al Aruri, who was killed uh, in the Beirut blast, was one of the most senior Hamas leaders killed by the IDF since the war began. Talk to us about how the death of Al Aruri on the Lebanese soil is going to spill over into a wider regional conflict. Well, everything depends on what happens next. Uh, it, it seems almost impossible to suggest that uh, Hassan Nasrallah won't retaliate, as he said he did. He had actually made some statements about that during the summer, that if Israel assassinated any member of the so-called axis of resistance on Lebanese soil, they would retaliate. And the fact that this was not just in Lebanon, but in the heart of the capital city, uh, I, I just can't imagine that they're going to let that go without uh, without some kind of response. And what happens next if if they have some kind of a response deep into Israel, and if it's some big kind of a of a of a strike, you can't imagine that Israel would also not retaliate again, only stronger after that. And of course, every time you get on the escalation rungs of that ladder, you get a chance to, to for this to explode into a much larger war, and then you have the potential for Iran to come into this on the mm. side of Hezbollah if it gets that far. And we've already got issues. I think you said a minute ago in the Red Sea, we have issues with, in the Iraq and in Syria with the United States forces being attacked, with Israel assassinating Iranian leaders in Syria. Uh, this is just a very volatile mix right now. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, uh, will the death of Al Aruri have some kind of an impact in terms of, uh, is it going to hinder the plans of Hamas militants going forward from now? Look, I, I think it's going to be very emotionally satisfying for the Israelis, uh, for, quite frankly, because uh, at least according to reports, he was one of the masterminds of the October 7th attack. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a lot of people very happy that, that he was taken out. However, when you're talking about operational effectiveness and especially tactical effectiveness, I, I don't think it's going to have any effect. I mean, I mean, we've seen what happened when Osama bin Laden was taken out. He was just replaced by Amin Zawahiri. Years later, he was taken out. Al-Baghdadi of ISIS was taken out. All kinds of uh, you know, mid-level people have constantly taken out, but they're constantly replaced. And sometimes when you take out these key leaders, they're replaced by someone even more violent and more radical after that. So it's not necessarily going to be better, but I, you can be assured that there'll be no shortage of people to replace him. Well, you speak of how Colonel Davis that uh, somebody will replace Al Aruri as well. But at this moment, Nathan, I was clearly emphasized on how one of the key strategies of Israel at the moment is to eliminate Hamas and uh, the Hamas leaders as well. Shed some light on Israel's strategy at the moment. We saw the idea of withdrawing uh, its troops from Gaza yesterday and now the Beirut airstrike. What is Israel's trajectory going forward? Look, Israel's getting into a tough spot because this is not like all their other wars in the past, which were relatively short and limited in scope. This one is much larger, and Israeli officials are saying earlier this afternoon that they expect that this is going to be, uh, you know, throughout the next year. They say all of 2024 probably. Uh, but they have domestic issues as well because this this whole judicial uh, r ruling against uh, Netanyahu is causing a lot of division within Israel. Uh, he's facing pressure from the family members uh, of the people that are still hostage in, in the Gaza Strip. 
He's also facing pressure on the domestic side from the uh, reservist, uh, you know, who, who already 300,000 of them were called up mm -hmm. and they just can't stay on duty forever because they have lives that affects their economy, et cetera. Then you also have additionally the issue that uh, the longer this war goes and the more the Palestinian civilians are killed, the, the greater the chance that they the Israelis lose the international support that they without which they can't conduct this war. So there's a lot of risk involved right now for, for the Israeli forces, even though militarily they're way above mm. Hamas that they ever could. But this thing could go longer and, and cause problems. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, for joining us. It's always good to have you on the show and listen to your insights. Thanks for joining in. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. And the killing of Hamas militant group's deputy chief Saleh al aruri has triggered protests across the West Bank. Thousands of Palestinians have taken to the streets of Ramallah and Hamas said that the killing will not lead to its defeat. Hezbollah vowed that Aruri's death will not go unpunished. Aruri's sister, Um Kutaiba, also joined the protests in the West Bank and she said that Aruri's contribution for Palestinians will be remembered for years to come, that her brother's influence will give rise to stronger and tougher leaders. Thank God. This is an honor from God. His martyrdom is an honor. He used to wish martyrdom and we are not surprised since this is the method of the occupation. The occupation did not skip any wrongdoing. Is this a surprise? It is not. It is only natural for the occupation, but thank God. Every child in Palestine is a leader and there will be stronger leaders and tougher and they will follow in his footsteps. There have been calls for more protests. Palestinians have been urged to participate in marches at 12 hours local time throughout West Bank major cities. And Israel has not yet confirmed any responsibility for this attack on Al Aruri. However, it has long accused Aruri of orchestrating attacks on its citizens. Now, Hamas officials had claimed that Aruri was at the heart of negotiations for the prisoner swap deal with Israel. And Israel has vowed to destroy Hamas after the movement's unprecedented October 7th attacks on Israel. And we begin with our top story right now with the latest updates coming in from the Israel-Hamas war. And Israel's war against Hamas militants has now reached Lebanon. According to Hamas and security officials in Lebanon, an Israeli strike has killed Hamas's deputy leader, and this is as per reports. Saleh al aruri was killed along with his bodyguards in an Israeli drone strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. The explosion shook Mushar Afai, one of the Lebanese capital's southern suburbs, and it's a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. Now, a Lebanese state media reported the strike hit a Hamas office, while other reports say that a total of seven were killed in the attack. At about 5.30, we heard the sound of an explosion, then another explosion, followed by a third explosion a few seconds later. The smoke was rising heavily. The explosion shook our office. Now, Saleh al aruri was the deputy head of Hamas and a founder of its military wing, the Qasem Brigades. He's also a designated, he's also a U.S. designated terrorist and has a bounty on his head. While... Israel has previously announced that the killing in Gaza of Hamas commanders and officials during the war, Aruri is the most high-profile figure to be killed, and his death came in the first strike on the Lebanese capital since hostilities began. And the strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Now, Israel has declined to comment on the death of Aruri. Although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagari, who did not directly comment on Aruri's killing, said that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. 
The IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas, in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. On the other hand, Hamas chief Ismail Haniya has said that Aruri's killing is a terrorist act and it is a violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and an expansion of Israel's hostility against Palestinians. Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah has vowed to retaliate against any Israeli targeting of Palestinian officials in Lebanon and they have warned that the killing of Aruri will not go unanswered or unpunished. A Palestinian Islamic Jihad has vowed a revenge in a statement saying that the crime will not go unpunished and the resistance will continue until the occupation is removed. Iran has said that the killing would further galvanize the fight against Israel, while Yemen's Houthi movement have expressed their condolences. Now, French President, meanwhile, Emmanuel Macron has called on Israel to avoid any escalation and Macron who spoke by telephone with the Israeli minister and his war cabinet member, Benny Gantz. Macron said that it is essential to avoid any escalatory attitude, particularly in Lebanon. And uh, to f talk about more on this, we were just joined by Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis uh, with additional updates on this story. Take a look. Look, I, I think it's going to be very emotionally satisfying for the Israelis, uh, for, quite frankly, because uh, at least according to reports, he was one of the masterminds of the October 7th attack. And so there's going to be a lot of people very happy that, that he was taken out. However, when you're talking about operational effectiveness and especially tactical effectiveness, I, I don't think it's going to have any effect. I mean, I mean, we've seen what happened when Osama bin Laden was taken out. He was just replaced by Amin Zawahiri. Years later, he was taken out. Al-Baghdadi of ISIS was taken out. All kinds of uh, you know, mid-level people have constantly taken out, but they're constantly replaced. And sometimes when you take out these key leaders, they're replaced by someone even more violent and, and more radical after that. So it's not necessarily going to be better, but I, you can be assured that there'll be no shortage of people to replace him. Miseries mount for thousands of people who have been made refugees in Gaza as winter tightens its grip in the region. The Rafah region of the Gaza Strip near the border with Egypt has become a tent city. Desperate Palestinians fleeing Israel's growing ground offensive are crowding into shrinking safe areas. With shelters significantly beyond capacity, people have pitched tents along the sides of the roads with just enough food to be able to survive. Thousands have relocated to the far south of the Strip and in areas declared as safe zones by the Israeli military. The numbers are so high that the UN Refugee Agency has warned that this may create additional displacement in West Asia. Everyone around the world is celebrating the New Year, watching fireworks shows. But for us, the fireworks show here is missiles. All we have are rockets and explosions, children being killed. My wish for the New Year is for the war to stop, so that we can return to our homes and live like ordinary people. And to make matters worse, the World Food Programme has said that their operations in the Strip are on the verge of collapse. Nearly 1.9 million people have been displaced since the start of the Israeli bombardment, with many yearning to go back home. The whole of Gaza has been destroyed. People could not celebrate the New Year. Our homes have been destroyed. I hope the war would end soon. I hope we can survive and live with dignity. I hope we can return to our homes, go back to school, return to everything that is familiar in the new year. Gazans are exposed to cold temperatures as they continue to live without food, water or blankets in the war torn strip. The cold has pushed Gazans to scavenge for wood to be able to burn fires for warmth. The wood from the debris of destroyed buildings has also run out, forcing the fires in Gaza to be fed by pieces of cloth and plastic. And for more on this, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, who is a military uh, uh, expert and the host of Daniel Davis Deep uh, Dive on YouTube, is joining us live from Virginia. Thanks very much for joining us on Beyond, Colonel Davis. Thanks for having me. 
Now, uh, Colonel Davis Al Aruri, who was killed uh, in the Beirut blast, was one of the most senior Hamas leaders killed by the IDF since the war began. Talk to us about how the death of Al Aruri on the Lebanese soil is going to spill over into a wider regional conflict. Well, everything depends on what happens next. Uh, it, it seems almost impossible to suggest that uh, Hassan Nasrallah won't retaliate, as he said he did. He had actually made some statements about that during the summer, that if Israel assassinated any member of the so-called axis of resistance on Lebanese soil, they would retaliate. And the fact that this was not just in Lebanon, but in the heart of the capital city, uh, I, I just can't imagine that they're going to let that go without uh, without some kind of response. And what happens next if if they have some kind of a response deep into Israel, and if it's some big kind of a of a of a strike, you can't imagine that Israel would also not retaliate again, only stronger after that. And of course, every time you get on the escalation rungs of that ladder, you get a chance to, to for this to explode into a much larger war. And then you have the potential for Iran to come into this on the mm. side of Hezbollah if it gets that far. And we've already got issues. I think you said a minute ago in the Red Sea, we have issues with, in the Iraq and in Syria with the United States forces being attacked, with Israel assassinating Iranian leaders in Syria. Uh, this is just a very volatile mix right now. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, uh, will the death of Al Aruri have some kind of an impact in terms of, uh, is it going to hinder the plans of Hamas militants going forward from now? Look, I, I think it's going to be very emotionally satisfying for the Israelis, uh, for, quite frankly, because uh, at least according to reports, he was one of the masterminds of the October 7th attack. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a lot of people very happy that, that he was taken out. However, when you're talking about operational effectiveness and especially tactical effectiveness, I, I don't think it's going to have any effect. I mean, I mean, we've seen what happened when Osama bin Laden was taken out. Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah has warned Israel against waging a war on Lebanon. The warning comes the day after reports suggest an Israeli strike killed Hamas's deputy leader in Beirut's southern suburb. The head of Lebanon's Hezbollah said they cannot be silent after the killing of Hamas's deputy leader. He further warned that his heavily armed forces would fight without any restrictions if Israel chose to extend the war from Gaza to Lebanon. If the enemy thinks of waging a war on Lebanon, we will fight without restraint, without rules, without limits and without restrictions. They know what I mean. Both the Iran-backed Lebanese terror group and Hamas have accused Israel of killing Saleh al arori in Beirut's Musharrafeh, a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. Nasrallah describing the attack as a major and dangerous crime. The Hezbollah chief has reiterated the warning that the attack will not go unanswered and unpunished. Yesterday's crime is a major and a dangerous crime and it cannot be tolerated. There isn't much to be said about this matter, as we said in Hezbollah's statement yesterday. This is a dangerous crime. It will not go unanswered and unpunished. Saleh al arori who was the deputy head of Hamas's Politburo and a founder of its military wing, the Qassam Brigades, Arori is the most high-profile figure to be killed and his death came in the first strike on the Lebanese capital since hostilities began. The strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagari, who did not directly comment on Arori's killing, said the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. Me, we're being joined by Professor Iran Yashiv, who's a professor of economics at the Tel Aviv University. Professor, thank you very much indeed for taking time out and joining us here in Vion. Now, the Bank of Israel has in fact pegged the number as $58 billion is the cost of Israel's war so far. Now, do you agree with this estimate? Do you think this is a conservative estimate? And how badly has this affected Israel's economy? Well, the estimate is uh, a, a shot in the dark. That is, it's very difficult to know uh, what the cost of war uh, now, and even more difficult to know what it will be throughout 2024. 
And the reason is that the data are not in yet on things like GDP in the relevant period, on consumption of people, on investment, etc. So it's a very rough estimate, and I would actually assume it's on the conservative side, especially given the fact that the Bank of Israel is probably the most optimistic forecaster of GDP growth next year. That is this right. new year, right. 2024. And also, you know, Israel has revised its interest rates at least about three times since the war began. Do you expect that this could become a trend as the war drags on? And how much of an issue is inflation because of this war within Israel? Actually, in terms of inflation, the news has been recently good. The Bank of Israel is expecting uh, something like 2.4% this year and uh, the capital market is expecting a little more but uh, it seems like reasonable to think that it will be somewhere around 2.4 2.5 percent which is within the inflation target of the bank of israel mm -hmm. and in fact war developments uh, tend to create or at least up till now, tended to create deflationary forces right. for a number of reasons. First of all, in real activity, there is a slowdown because, uh, because people are mobilizing the war, because consumption goes down, because tourism goes down, and there has been a significant appreciation of the currency of the shekel, right. which is a deflationary force. So Israel's problem right now is not inflation. Mm -hmm. Inflation is coming down. Right. And from this point of view, one can reduce interest rates. And also, how much of a concern do you think is the national debt for Israel? You know, the most recent figures pegged that number to be almost about $300 billion. And this was, you know, with respect to December 2022. And with the war having dragged on for one over three months, do you think national debt for Israel is, is a serious concern that the Israeli foreign finance minister will have to look at? Actually, it doesn't look like at this point, although it may become a concern later on. I'll explain why. First of all, it's useful to speak as capital markets do in terms of percentage of GDP and Israel's debt uh, ratio, debt to GDP ratio at the end of 2022 was 660.5%, mm -hmm. which is very good by Western standards, at least ever since the global financial crisis of 15 years ago. Right. Uh, in fact, it's almost uh, in line with the Maastricht criteria that everybody uh, wishes to attain in an ideal world. Mm -hmm. It's gone up to 62%, which is not a big rise. And the Bank of Israel is now forecasting a rise to 66%. Right. This is still manageable and not an issue for concern. When may it become an issue? If the government uh, on the fiscal side doesn't do the proper uh, action, and uh, if the government budget deficit balloons and then we may be under a different dynamic and a different story. Right. Uh, but so far, it hasn't been long, three months. Uh, nothing extremely serious has happened, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a risk of a fiscal uh, runaway, especially with this current government and finance minister. Right. So one should watch out. And I think the governor, Amir Yaron, was alluding to that. Absolutely indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Yashi, for taking time out and speaking to us here on Beyond Air. Sure, thank you. Now, the war in the Gaza Strip is taking some kind of financial toll on Israel. In the latest, the Bank of Israel has in fact been forced to lower its short-term borrowing rates for the first time in nearly about four years. This makes Israel the first developed nation to in fact cut interest rates for the first time since April 2020. Now, the central bank governor, Amir Yaron, has cited a stabilization of the financial markets since the outbreak of the war on the 7th of October. 
along with the declining inflation rate and the weaker economic conditions in Israel at this moment. Now, the central bank has also urged the lawmakers to rein in public spending. Now, Yaron told reporters that defense and civilian costs of the war are expected to reach almost about $58 billion. And this will be a budgetary burden. Now, Amir Yaron has also pointed out that the government's inaction so far on making the needed budget adjustments. This includes measures such as cutting back on redundant ministries. But Yaron, however, has not given the details of the redundant ministries that he was referring to. And to give us more perspective in terms of what is happening at this moment with the Israeli economy, we're being joined by Professor Iran Yashiv, who's a professor of economics at the Tel Aviv University. Professor, thank you very much indeed for taking time out and joining us here in Vion. Now, the Bank of Israel has in fact pegged the number as $58 billion is the cost of Israel's war so far. Now, do you agree with this estimate? Do you think this is a conservative estimate? And how badly has this affected Israel's economy? Well, the estimate is uh, a, a shot in the dark. That is, it's very difficult to know uh, what the cost of war uh, now and even more difficult to know what it will be throughout 2024. And the reason is that the data are not in yet on things like GDP in the relevant period, on consumption of people, on investment, etc. So it's a very rough estimate, and I would actually assume it's on the conservative side, especially given the fact that the Bank of Israel is probably the most optimistic forecaster of GDP growth next year. That is this right. new year, right. 2024. And also, you know, Israel has revised its interest rates at least about three times since the war began. Do you expect that this could become a trend as the war drags on? And how much of an issue is inflation because of this war within Israel? Actually, in terms of inflation, the news has been recently good. The Bank of Israel is expecting uh, something like 2.4% this year and uh, the capital market is expecting a little more but uh, it seems like reasonable to think that it will be somewhere around 2.4-2.5 percent which is within the inflation target of the Bank of Israel mm -hmm. and in fact war developments uh, tend to create or at least up till now, tended to create deflationary forces right. for a number of reasons. First of all, in real activity, there is a slowdown because, uh, because people are mobilizing the war, because consumption goes down, because tourism goes down, and there has been a significant appreciation of the currency of the shekel, right. which is a deflationary force. So Israel's problem right now is not inflation. Mm -hmm. Inflation is coming down. Right. And from this point of view, one can reduce interest rates. And also, how much of a concern do you think is the national debt for Israel? You know, the most recent figures pegged that number to be almost about $300 billion. And this was, you know, with respect to December 2022. And with the war having dragged on for one over three months, do you think national debt for Israel is, is a serious concern that the Israeli foreign finance minister will have to look on? Actually, it doesn't look like at this point, although it may become a concern later on. I'll explain why. First of all, it's useful to speak as capital markets do in terms of percentage of GDP and Israel's debt uh, ratio, debt to GDP ratio at the end of 2022 was 660.5%, mm -hmm. which is very good by Western standards, at least ever since the global financial crisis of 15 years ago. Right. Uh, in fact, it's almost uh, in line with the Maastricht criteria that everybody uh, wishes to attain in an ideal world. Mm -hmm. It's gone up to 62%, which is not a big rise. 
And the Bank of Israel is now forecasting a rise to 66%. Right. This is still manageable and not an issue for concern. When may it become an issue? If the government uh, on the fiscal side doesn't do the proper uh, action, and uh, if the government budget deficit balloons, and then we may be under a different dynamic and a different story. Right. Uh, but so far, it hasn't been long, three months. Uh, nothing extremely serious has happened, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a risk of a fiscal uh, runaway, especially with this current government and finance minister. Right. So one should watch out. And I think the governor, Amir Yaron, was alluding to that. Absolutely indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Yashi, for taking time out and speaking to us here on Beyond Them. Sure, thank you. And in the latest reports and updates from the Israel Hamas war, fears are mounting over Israel's war in Gaza spiraling across West Asia and after twin explosions in Iran on Wednesday claimed at least 95 lives. And this came on the back of an Israeli strike in Lebanon that killed Hamas's deputy chief. Israeli forces kept up their assault on the Gaza Strip telling civilians to leave a refugee camp in the north of the Palestinian enclave. And Israeli forces bombed al Nusayrat, a refugee camp in the northern part of Hamas-ruled enclave overnight and into Wednesday, destroying several multi-floor buildings. Now, Israeli planes also dropped leaflets on al Nusayrat, ordering people to leave seven districts. And Israeli warplanes and tanks also stepped up attacks on the al Buraj refugee camp. On the other hand, Hamas's armed wing said that it had killed 10 Israeli soldiers in fighting and in al Buraj and hit five tanks and troop carriers. In the al Maghazi refugee camp, at least four people were killed in an Israeli airstrike on a house. And they said that three people were also killed in an airstrike on a house in Rafah in the south of Gaza. Rescue workers and civilians searched through rubble for survivors and bodies. Israeli troops fighting in Gaza Strip were seen regrouping and restocking in southern Israel as heavy fighting raged in central and southern Gaza. And a convoy of Israeli military vehicles were also seen driving along the road and tanks were seen moving along the fields. Israel released footage of what it says are airstrikes on Hamas targets and this comes as fierce fighting continues in central and southern Gaza. Now, around Khan Yunis and other cities in the cramped enclave where most of Gaza's 2.3 million people have fled, Israel's chief military spokesman, Dan Daniel Hagri, said that Israel was uh, using new methods to try to rid Gaza's second largest city, Khan Yunis, of its underground tunnel network. In Gaza, in Khan Yunis, our forces continue to operate underground. It is an operation that takes time because of the security of our forces and also because we are using classified and new means and do not need to reveal our fighting methods to the enemy. This operation will take time and we will do it thoroughly in Khan Yunis until we reach all the places we need to go. This is fighting terrorists both underground and above ground. Meanwhile, the Israeli military said that Israeli hostage Saha Baruch, who was killed last month during a rescue attempt by special forces in Gaza, and they gave no further details. Baruch was among the 240 hostages who were seized by Hamas gunmen when they stormed into southern Israel on October 7th. And Hamas said on December 8th that a hostage it named as Saha Baruch had been killed during an attempted rescue operation. And we begin with the latest updates coming in from the Israel-Hamas war, which is our top focus right now. Israel's war against Hamas militants has reached Lebanon. And according to Hamas security officials in Lebanon, Israeli strike has killed Hamas's deputy leader. And as per reports, Saleh al aruri was killed along with his bodyguards in an Israeli drone strike on Beirut's southern suburbs. And the explosion shook Musharrafai, one of the Lebanese capital's southern suburbs. It's a stronghold of the militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. And Lebanese state media reported the strike hit a Hamas office, while other reports say that a total of seven people were killed in the attack.
At about 5.30, we heard the sound of an explosion, then another explosion, followed by a third explosion a few seconds later. The smoke was rising heavily. The explosion shook our office. Salial Aruri was the deputy head of Amans' Politburo and a founder of its military wing, the Qasam Brigades. Now, he's also a U.S.-designated terrorist and has a bounty on his head. While well, Israel has previously announced that the killing in Gaza of Hamas commanders and officials during the war, Aruri is the most high-profile figure to be killed, and his death came in the first strike on the Lebanese capital since hostilities began. Now, the strike also marks the first killing of Hamas officials outside Palestinian territories, and Israel has declined to comment on the death of Aruri. Although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagri, who did not directly comment on Aluri's, Aruri's killing, he said that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. The IDF is in a very high state of readiness in all arenas, in defense and offense. We are highly prepared for any scenario. On the other hand, Hamas chief Ismail Haniyeh has said that Aruri's killing is a terrorist act and it is a violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and an expansion of Israel's hostility against Palestinians. Now, Hezbollah leader Sayed Hassan Nasrallah has vowed to retaliate against any Israeli targeting of Palestinian officials in Lebanon and they've warned that the killing of Aruri will not go unanswered or unpunished. Now, Palestinian Islamic Jihad has vowed a revenge in a statement, saying that the crime will not go unpunished and the resistance will continue until the occupation is removed. Iran has said that the killing would further galvanize the fight against Israel, while Yemen's Houthi movement have expressed their condolences. I mean, while French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Israel to avoid escalation, and Macron, who spoke by telephone with the Israeli minister and war cabinet member Benny Gantz, he said that it is essential to avoid any escalatory attitude, particularly in Lebanon. Now, the deputy leader of Hamas's political wing, Saleh al aruri has been killed in Lebanon's Beirut. And our next report looks at who was Saleh al aruri the man who is a U.S.-designated terrorist. Take a look. 57-year-old Saleh al aruri he was the deputy chief of Hamas's political bureau and one of the founders of the group's armed wing, the al Qasim Brigades. Apart from this, he had been living in exile in Lebanon for the past few years. And after spending 15 years in an Israeli jail, Aruri in recent weeks took on the role of spokesperson for the group. Well, before the war began on October 7th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had threatened to kill Aruri, Salah al-Aruri, had threatened to kill him. The United States has also labeled him as a global terrorist in the year 2015. Apart from this, uh, uh, the, the U.S. also issued a $5 million reward for any information on Salah al-Aruri, who has been designated as a wanted terrorist. Well, the Qasim Brigades was founded in 1992, and Salah al-Aruri is one of the founders of the Qasim Brigades. And the founding leader of the military wing was Salah Shehda, who was later killed in 2002 by the Israeli forces. Although the actual leader is Muhammad Dev. He has been often described as a shadowy figure who has been living in hiding for two decades. We're talking about Muhammad Dev here. And this is because Dev's name is at the top of Israel's most wanted list. Now, the Qasim Brigade's objective is to support its armed resistance against Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. The Qasim Brigade has also carried out numerous attacks, including suicide attacks against Israel as a part of its armed struggle. Now, I will tell you how strong are the Qasim Brigades. 
Well, according to the CIA World Factbook, the Carson Brigade, it has around 20,000 to 25,000 members. However, that number, this number of 20, 25,000 member, that number is disputed as of now. Well, the armed group is believed uh, to possess a large inventory of ammunition, grenades and improvised rockets, though its exact strength and military capabilities are not publicly known. Allegedly, Iran has also supported the military wing financially for the enabling group to manufacture sophisticated military capabilities. Although in the past one and a half decade of Israeli attacks, the Qasim Brigades, it has thousands of fighters and its resources have depleted in numerous Israeli air raids and military offensive in the past as well. And fears are mounting of Israel's war in Gaza spiraling across West Asia after twin explosions in Iran on Wednesday claimed at least 103 lives. And this came on the back of an Israeli strike in Lebanon that killed Hamas's deputy chief. Israeli forces kept up their assault on the Gaza Strip, telling civilians to leave a refugee camp in the north of the Palestinian enclave. Israeli forces bombed al Nusairet refugee camp in the northern part of the Hamas-ruled enclave overnight and into Wednesday, destroying several multi-floor buildings. The Israeli planes also dropped leaflets on the refugee camp, ordering people to leave seven districts. Now, the Israeli warplanes and tanks also stepped up attacks on the al Buraj refugee camp. On the other hand, Hamas's armed wing said that it had killed 10 Israeli soldiers in fighting in al Baraj and hit five tanks and troop carriers. Meanwhile, in the al Maghazi refugee camp, at least four people were killed in an Israeli airstrike on a house. They said three people were also killed in an airstrike on a house in Rafah in the south of Gaza. The rescue workers and civilians searched through rubble for survivors and bodies. Israeli troops fighting in the Gaza Strip were seen a regrouping and restocking and in southern Israel as heavy fighting raged in central and southern Gaza and a convoy of Israeli military vehicles were also seen driving along a road and tanks were seen moving along the fields. Israel released a footage of what it says are airstrikes on Hamas targets and this comes as fierce fighting continues in central and southern Gaza. That is around Khan Yunus and other cities in the cramped enclave, where most of Gaza's 2.3 million people have fled. Now, Israel's chief military spokesman, uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagri, said that Israel was using new methods to try to rid Gaza's second largest city, Khan Yunus, of its underground tunnel network. In Gaza, in Khan Yunus, our forces continue to operate underground. It is an operation that takes time because of the security of our forces and also because we are using classified and new means and do not need to reveal our fighting methods to the enemy. This operation will take time and we will do it thoroughly in Khan Yunus until we reach all the places we need to go. This is fighting terrorists both underground and above ground. Meanwhile, the Israeli military said that Israeli hostage Sahed Baruch was killed last month during a rescue attempt by the special forces in Gaza. They gave no further details. Baruch was among the 240 hostages taken by Hamas militants when they stormed into southern Israel on October 7th. Hamas said on December 8th that a hostage it named as Sahed Baruch had been killed during an attempted rescue operation. Almost three months into the war, Israel continues to pursue its objectives of undoing Hamas's military capabilities and freeing the hostages. Now, Israel has announced plans to shift tactics and cut back on troop deployment, but fears of a regional conflagration persist, and the killing of the Hamas deputy leader in Beirut has now raised the risk of the war in Gaza spreading. Here's a look at the war tactics and the road ahead. Experts say that Israel will need many more months to achieve its goal of eliminating Hamas group's ability to control Gaza and threaten Israel. 
Following a humanitarian pause and the release of more than 100 hostages, Israel has moved into its current, more intensive phase. It has expanded operations into South Gaza to weaken Hamas's military capabilities and target its leadership. Over the coming weeks, Israel expects to continue this intensive phase in the south alongside renewed diplomatic and military efforts to rescue the remaining hostages. According to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the end of this phase will not necessarily signal the end of the war. On Monday, Israel pulled tanks out of some Gaza city districts. Israeli officials say the military would draw down forces inside Gaza this month and shift to a months-long phase of more localized mopping up operations. The hints at a lower tempo in Gaza came as the U.S. Navy announced that the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier was returning to its home port in Virginia. The warship was deployed to the eastern Mediterranean following the outbreak of war. The true production would allow some reservists to return to civilian life and shore up Israel's war-battered economy. Artillery fire between Hezbollah and Israel has unsettled the border since the start of the Gaza conflict. At the same time, Houthi fighters in Yemen have attacked Red Sea shipping, drawing a U.S. military response. An Iranian warship recently sailed into the waterway. Israel's move to a new stage in the conflict comes after its initial bombardment and a ground invasion that began on October 27th. Air and artillery strikes have continued to pound the entire enclave during that time, leaving much of it in ruin. Having overrun most of northern Gaza, Israeli tanks and troops are still pushing into the center and parts of the south. Hamas is responding with guerrilla-style ambush from tunnels and bunkers in the enclave's narrow streets. Qatar and Egypt are seeking to negotiate a new truce and a hostages deal. Washington has said that Israel should allow a Palestinian government to control Gaza when the conflict is over. The UN, meanwhile, says that 2023 was the deadliest year on record for Palestinians in West Bank, with 307 killed since the war in Gaza began on October 7th. We are almost three months into the war. Israel continues to pers pursue its objectives of undoing Hamas's military capabilities and also freeing hostages. Now, Israel has announced plans to shift tactics and cut back on troop deployment. But fears of a regional conflagration persists and that the killing of Hamas deputy leader in Beirut has raised the risk of the war in Gaza to spread. Here's a look at the war tactics and the road ahead. Experts say that Israel will need many more months to achieve its goal of eliminating the Hamas group's ability to control Gaza and threaten Israel. Following a humanitarian pause and the release of over 100 hostages, Israel has moved into its current more intensive phase. It has expanded operations into South Gaza to weaken Hamas military capabilities and also target its leadership. Over the next coming weeks, Israel expects to continue the intensive phase in the south alongside renewed diplomatic and military efforts to rescue the remaining hostages. Now, as per the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the end of the phase will not necessarily signal the end of the war. On Monday, Israel pulled tanks out of some Gaza city districts. Israeli officials say that the military would draw down forces inside Gaza this month and shift to a months-long phase of more localized mopping up operations. The hints at a lowered tempo in Gaza came as the U.S. Navy announced the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier was returning to its home port in Virginia. The warship was deployed to the eastern Mediterranean following the outbreak of war. The troop production would allow some reservists to return to civilian life and shore up Israel's war-battered economy. Artillery fire between Hezbollah and Israel has unsettled the border since the start of the Gaza conflict. At the same time, Houthi fighters in Yemen have attacked Red Sea shipping, drawing a U.S. military response. An Iranian warship recently sailed into the waterway. Israel's move to a new stage in the conflict comes after its initial bombardment and a group invasion that began on October 27th. Air and artillery strikes have continued to pound the entire enclave during that time, leaving much of it in ruins. Having overrun most of northern Gaza, Israeli tanks and troops are still pushing into the center and parts of the south. 
Hamas is responding with guerrilla-style ambushes from tunnels and bunkers in the enclave's narrow streets. Qatar and Egypt are seeking to negotiate a new truce and hostage deal. Washington has said that Israel should allow a Palestinian government to control Gaza when the conflict is over. The UN says that 2023 was the deadliest year on record for Palestinians in West Bank, with 307 killed since the war in Gaza began on October 7th. Months into the war, Israel continues to pursue its objectives of degrading Hamas's military capabilities and freeing hostages. Now Israel has announced plans to shift tactics and cut back on troop numbers, but fears of a regional conflagration persist, and the killing of the Hamas deputy leader in Beirut has raised the risk of the war in Gaza spreading. Here's a look at the war tactics and the road ahead. Experts say Israel will need many more months to achieve its goal of eliminating the Hamas group's ability to control Gaza and threaten Israel. Following a humanitarian pause and the release of over 100 hostages, Israel has moved into its current more intensive phase. It has expanded operations into South Gaza to weaken Hamas military capabilities and target its leadership. Over the coming weeks, Israel expects to continue the intensive phase in the south alongside renewed diplomatic and military efforts to rescue the remaining hostages. Now, as per the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the end of this phase will not necessarily signal the end of the war. On Monday, Israel pulled tanks out of some Gaza city districts. Israeli officials say the military would draw down forces inside Gaza this month and shift to a months-long phase of more localized mopping up operations. The hints at a lower tempo in Gaza came as the U.S. Navy announced that the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier was returning to its home port in Virginia. The warship was deployed to the eastern Mediterranean following the outbreak of war. The troop reduction would allow some reservists to return to civilian life and shore up Israel's war-battered economy. Artillery fire between Hezbollah and Israel has unsettled the border since the start of the conflict. At the same time, Houthi fighters in Yemen have attacked Red Sea shipping, drawing a U.S. military response. An Iranian warship recently sailed into the waterway. Israel's move to a new stage in the conflict comes after its initial bombardment and a ground invasion that began on October 27th. Air and artillery strikes have continued to pound the entire enclave during the time, leaving much of it in ruins. Having overrun most of northern Gaza, Israeli tanks and troops are still pushing into the center and parts of the south. Hamas is responding with guerrilla-style ambush from tunnels and bunkers in the enclave's narrow streets. Qatar and Egypt are seeking to negotiate a new truce and hostages deal. Washington has said that Israel should allow a Palestinian government to control Gaza when the conflict is over. The UN says that the year 2023 was the deadliest on record for Palestinians in West Bank, with 307 killed since the war in Gaza began on October 7th. Now, for more on this, we are being joined by our correspondent, Jody Cohen from Ranana. Jody, welcome to be on. Now, there have been allegations that Israel carried out the strike. What more can you tell us about what Israel is saying? Hi, Priyanka. So there hasn't been an official comment from the Israeli government on this. According to a U.S. media report, which quoted unnamed Israeli and U.S. sources, that said that Israel carried out this drone strike in Beirut, killing six Hamas figures, including two senior Hamas officers and, of course, the Hamas deputy head Salah al-Aruri. Now, he was the leader of Hamas in the West Bank, a founding member of Hamas, and according to intelligence, he was responsible for all orchestrating many terror attacks against Israelis, such as the 2014 murder of three Israeli teens, and has been wanted by Israel for years. Now, so while there's no official comment, we do know that Israel's war goals are to dismantle Hamas, secure the release of the roughly 130 hostages still being held captive in Gaza and to ensure that there's no threat on Israel's borders. And in November, Prime Minister Netanyahu said in a press conference that he had instructed the Mossad to target Hamas's leaders wherever they are. And Mark Regev, who's the senior Israeli government spokesperson, he said last night that whoever did this, this was a precision attack on Hamas. He said it wasn't an attack on Lebanon or an attack on Hezbollah and his comments are being interpreted as um, potentially trying to convince Hezbollah to limit its response.
Right, Jody, what response is expected from Hezbollah in Lebanon? I think that's the very important question. Absolutely. So Daniel Hagari, who's the Israel Defense Forces spokesperson, he didn't specifically mention this strike, but said that the Israeli military is at a very high level of readiness. And according to media reports on Tuesday, Israel was expecting a response. Hezbollah has claimed 10 attacks on Israel in the past day. And remember, we've seen daily strikes from Hezbollah into Israel since the 8th of October, which is the day after uh, Hamas's 7th of October massacre in Israel and in the past week especially we've seen a significant uptick in rockets from Hezbollah into Israel but Nasrallah who's the head of Hezbollah he was due to meet with al Aruri today and give a speech on the anniversary of the death of Qasem Soleimani Iran's Quds Force commander who was killed in the US airstrike and remember Iran had said that the 7th of October attack was revenge for that killing and Nasrallah speech we heard was going to be delayed now we're hearing it is going to happen this evening but in August he had warned that he would take revenge that Hezbollah would take revenge if Israel would go after any Syrian Iranian Palestinian or Lebanese leaders in Lebanon and we so we're expecting to see some sort of response. We don't know if that would come from Hezbollah or Hamas potentially in Lebanon or Hamas from Gaza. Um, but commentators are also referring to the Israeli government's strategy of putting military pressure on Hamas as a way potentially to bring them to talks. And of course, remains to be seen whether or not this strike, even though Israel is saying it's not, uh, is not commenting on whether or not it's come from Israel, it remains to be seen if by targeting Hamas leaders that we will see any potential future development in those talks. Right, let's talk about the hostage deal. Where does that stand in all of this? That's my final question. So we're not hearing of significant progress being made in this hostage deal. We've been hearing about two different talks recently, potentially number one, talks on a temporary uh, pause in the fighting in exchange for some of the hostages being released. And according to reports, Israel and Hamas's positions are far apart on that. And then we've also been hearing about Egypt's proposal, which would be for a permanent ceasefire, the release of all the hostages, and to have Gaza governed by a um, technocratic government of Palestinians. Um, we had heard that Islamic Jihad and Hamas had rejected that. Then we heard that they um, were going to Egypt for further talks. We know that an Israeli delegation's also been in Cairo for talks, but it remains to be seen as of yet uh, what will happen with either of those proposals. Right, Jody, thank you so much for all those updates and thanks for joining us at We On On This Hour. Now, uh, regional tensions have escalated as the war between Israel and Hamas spills over and it is impacting the neighboring areas with increased security concerns. And near Israel's tense northern border with Lebanon, residents fear that the killing of deputy leader of Hamas in Beirut could spark a war with their neighbor. And during the nearly three months of fighting between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, the Israeli army has been exchanging cross-border fire with Lebanon's Hezbollah, which is allied with Hamas. However, anxiety levels have shot up with the death of Hamas number two, Saleh al ruri in a strike in Beirut. Now, meanwhile, the security concerns is not just restricted to Lebanon. Residents of the coastal city of Israel, Naharia, worry about war with Lebanon as their economic lifelines have already taken a hit. And according to some residents, shop sales have fallen by half in recent weeks and many businesses have shut down. Now, soldiers have described this area as, quote unquote, a closed military zone. And from teenagers to the elderly, many spoke of a fear gripping Naharia. United Nations peacekeepers who patrol the frontier have warned that further escalation can have devastating consequences.
We begin with our top story right now, which comes in from West Asia. As tensions in West Asia are near the boiling point, even as Arab nations and West look desperately to water down heating temperatures, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is again dashing off to the region in an effort to contain the fears of a bigger conflagration as a multi-pronged crisis stares. Now, Israeli forces and Hamas militants are already at war in Gaza for more than two months, and the Red Sea has emerged as a big friction point here. Now, where Houthi forces based in Yemen and backed by Iran have been attacking fr freighters with real or perceived links to Israel. And then we have the recent attacks happening in Iran and Lebanon, where almost 95 people were killed in the blast near Qasem Soleimani Memorial on the fourth anniversary of his killing by the U.S. and then the Israeli strike that killed Hamas's deputy leader Saleh al-Aruri in one of the suburbs of the Lebanese capital Beirut. Now, in Iran, Tehran has blamed the United States and Israel for the twin explosions that has killed at least 95 and injured over 200. These blasts took place at a ceremony in Iran to commemorate country's top commander, Qasem Soleimani, who was killed by a U.S. drone in 2020. Now, Iran's elite supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, has vowed a harsh response, while President Ibrahim Raisi has called out Israel. I warn the Zionist regime, don't doubt it. You will pay the price for this crime. These crimes that you have committed, you will deeply regret. Now, U.S. has rejected Iran's claim of their or their ally Israel's involvement in the attack. Washington says that escalation in West Asia is a no one's interest as the attack comes on the heels of raging war in Gaza. Meanwhile, in Lebanon, Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah has warned Israel against waging war on Lebanon. And the warning comes a day after reports suggest an Israeli strike killed Hamas's deputy leader in Beirut's southern suburb. <laughs> If the enemy thinks of waging a war on Lebanon, we will fight without restraint, without rules, without limits and without restrictions. They know what I mean. Now, both the Iran-backed Lebanese terror group and Hamas have accused Israel of killing Saleh al aruri in Beirut's Musharrafay, a stronghold of militant Hezbollah group, which is an ally of Hamas. Saleh al aruri who is the deputy head of Hamas's Politburo and founder of its military wing, the Qassam Brigades, Aruri is the most high-profile figure to be killed and his death came in the first strike on the Lebanese capital since hostilities began. Now, the strike also marks the first killing of a Hamas official outside Palestinian territories. Now, although Israeli army spokesperson Daniel Hagri, who did not directly comment on Aruri's killing, has still said that the military is highly prepared for any scenario in its aftermath. While, on the other hand, the United States has said that it was not informed in advance about the strike that killed the number two leader of Hamas. Can I follow up on that, Matt? When did you, when were you informed about the strike in Beirut? Uh, I'm not going to get into um, uh, uh, that specific detail, but we were not informed in advance. Now, seeing these tensions rising in Lebanon, Canada and Germany have urged its citizens to leave Lebanon quickly, warning that an expansion of the Israel-Hamas war could not be ruled out. And it's not just on land where the Gaza war is spreading over the borders. In fact, tensions are spilling over from Gaza to the Red Sea now. And as fears of a maritime war continue to mount, the Red Sea has become the new battleground. With the Yemen's Houthi rebels attacking cargo vessels that are en route to Israel through the southern Red Sea, and according to the UN's maritime agency, 18 shipping companies are rerouting their vessels around Africa to avoid the Red Sea amid an upsurge in attacks on shipping. A significant number of companies, around 18 of shipping companies, have already decided to reroute their vessels around South Africa in order to reduce the attacks on vessels and, of course, the impact that it has on seafarers in particular. This represents an additional 10 days to the journeys and, of course, has also a negative impact on trade and an increase on freight rates. 
Now, members of the UN Security Council have also called on Yemen's Houthis to halt their attacks on shipping vessels. In fact, they say that it is threatening the regional stability, global freedom of navigation and food supplies. Addressing the Council's first meeting of 2024, members also demanded that the Houthis release Galaxy Leader, a Japanese-operated cargo ship linked to an Israeli company and its crew, which the group seized on November 19th. Now, the United States believes that the situation has reached an inflection point at the moment. And while well, continuing with the Israel-Hamas war, Israel will appear before the International Court of Justice at The Hague after South Africa accused it of committing genocide in the Gaza Strip. South Africa had urged the ICJ on Friday to issue an urgent order to declare that Israel was violating its obligations under the 1948 Genocide Convention. In response, Israel says it will appear before the court to dispel South Africa's accusations and Israeli government spokesperson has said, and I quote, we assure South Africa's leaders history will judge you and it will judge you without mercy. For decades, South Africa has supported Palestinian aspirations for statehood. Since the start of the current war in Gaza, South Africa has accused Israel of committing war crimes. It has termed the sub suffering of Gazans similar to those experienced by the black majority during the apartheid. Israel has strongly rejected the comparison while calling South Africa's lawsuit baseless. South Africa's uh, Department of International Relations and Cooperation has said its lawyers are preparing for the hearing on January 11th and 12th and according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, Israel Hamas war has so far claimed 23,000 lives. For more on this, our correspondent Calden Ongwu sent us this report from Johannesburg. The South African government has made its position clear, expressing support for the Palestinians amid the ongoing attacks by Israel in the Gaza Strip. However, one should note that this support did not just start on October 7th. South Africa has always been vocal about freedom for Palestinian people for decades. Israel has been summoned to appear before International Court of Justice and be part of the hearing. South Africa's Department of International Relations and Cooperation said that its legal team is currently preparing for the case to be heard on the 11th and 12th at The Hague next week. Some of the top lawyers of the country have been roped in into this case. The department said South Africa is looking forward to tabling its documents in a formal hearing before the court and to hear what it says. Local and international experts have said South Africa has taken a big and bold step and it is likely it may even win an order against Israel. Malaysia has endorsed South Africa's application and it is likely other countries may also follow suit. Israel has also confirmed that they will appear before the International Court of Justice to challenge South Africa's application. More than 22,000 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have died after three months of relentless Israel bombardment. South Africa has described Israel's actions in Gaza as genocidal in character. This is Calden Almo from Johannesburg, South Africa, for We On, World Is One. A senior Hamas leader has allegedly been killed by an Israeli precision strike in Lebanon's Beirut on Tuesday. The incident has further strengthened fears of an all-out war between Israel and the Iran-backed militant group, the Hezbollah. The development comes amid escalating tensions in the Red Sea and spiraling global support for Netanyahu's Gaza campaign. It also comes at a time when Turkey is cracking down on alleged Israeli spies. Saleh al ururi considered Hamas's number two, was killed in a suspected Israeli strike in Beirut. He was also one of the founders of its military wing, the Qasim Brigade. Israel has not confirmed whether it was behind the blast. However, the country's military maintains it is prepared for any scenario as the focus turns towards an expected response. אני רוצה לענות בצורה ברורה, כפי שאמרתי בהצהרה. אני לא מתייחס למה שנשמע כאן או במקומות אחרים. אנחנו ממוקדים בלחימה בחמאס מתחילת הדרך, וכך נמשיך לעשות את זה. בעורף אנחנו מעדכנים את הציבור בהנחיות. 
On the other hand, Lebanon's caretaker Prime Minister Najib Mikati has slammed Israel. He has called the strike a new Israeli crime and said it was an attempt to pull Lebanon into the war. The Hezbollah militant group is also one is also on the edge. The group has said that the attack, quote unquote, will not go without a response or punishment, adding that the resistance has the finger on the trigger. Meanwhile, the West Bank is also on the boil over the killing of Aruri. A sea of protesters marched through Ramallah's streets while chanting O Jihad, O Qasim, revenge uh, as well. As the blame game is mounting, so are Israeli airstrikes within the Lebanese territory. On Tuesday, the Israeli army released videos it says show strikes on Hezbollah targets in the country. On the, other, on the world stage, however, one of Netanyahu's staunchest allies, the French President Emmanuel Macron, has called on Israel to avoid escalation, particularly in Lebanon. The United Nations, too, has called the alleged Israeli strike that killed Hamas's number two, quote, unquote, extremely worrying. We have been, just as you, have been following these uh, recent developments, which just happened a few minutes ago. Um, obviously, the developments are extremely worrying. Meanwhile, tensions also continue simmering in the Red Sea. Uh, Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi rebels fired two missiles late Tuesday towards the merchant ships. The British Maritime Security Agency, the UK MTO, released the report. This as global shipping firms continue to pause Red Sea shipments. In the latest, Denmark's Masek and German rival Hapag Lloyd have said their container ships would continue to avoid the Red Sea route. And amid the escalating threats from Iran-backed militant groups in Iraq, Syria and Yemen, the U.S. has quietly reached an agreement with Qatar to keep operating its largest military base in the Middle East. The al Quaid air base located southwest of Doha can house more than 10,000 American troops. Now, over in Turkey, security forces have arrested 34 people. They are alleged to have been involved in spying and planning abductions for Israel's Mossad intelligence agency. The mass arrests come after Erdogan warned Israel of serious consequences if it tried to hunt down Hamas militants in the country. And for more on this, our correspondent Jody Cohen has sent us this report from Israel. There's been no official comments from Israel regarding the assassination of Hamas's deputy leader, Saleh al aruri But what do we know? We know that Aruri has been accused of orchestrating many terror attacks against Israelis. We know that in November, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he'd instructed the Mossad security agency to target Hamas's leaders wherever they might be in response to Hamas's 7th of October massacre. And we know that the Israeli government believes that further military pressure on Hamas would ultimately drive it to accepting another deal on the release of the hostages still being held captive in Gaza. Now, Israeli government spokesperson Mark Regev said that whoever killed Aruri, this was a precision attack on Hamas, not on Lebanon and not on Hezbollah. Meanwhile, Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah is expected to give a speech in which he's likely to respond to this incident. In August, he had warned Israel again against targeting Hamas leaders in Lebanon, suggesting if this happened, that Hezbollah would take revenge. This is Jody Cohen for We On, World as One. The U.S. has denounced remarks by two Israeli ministers who said that Palestinians should be encouraged to emigrate from Gaza. Israeli ministers Ben Gvir and Smotrich had also called for Jewish settlers to return to the besieged territory. Israel unilaterally withdrew the last of its troops and settlers in 2005. The 2005 move ended the presence inside Gaza that began in 1967, but Israel has maintained near complete control over the enclave's borders. The U.S. State Department said that Washington rejects recent statements advocating resettlement of Palestinians outside of Gaza. Hitting out, the spokesperson Matthew Miller dubbed the rhetoric inflammatory and irresponsible. He reiterated the U.S. position that Gaza is Palestinian land and will remain Palestinian land with Hamas no longer in control of its future 
and with no terror groups able to threaten Israel. On Monday, Israel's firebrand national security minister, Itamar Ben Gvir, said that, and I quote, at this point, we must promote a solution to encourage the emigration of Gaza's residents. The government under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has not officially suggested that it has any plans to evict Gazans or to send Jewish settlers back to the territory. But Ben Gvir argued that the departure of Palestinians and the re-establishment of Israeli settlements is a correct, just, moral 